Welcome to the Great Hall of Lincoln's Inn on this very cold evening. Uh, my thanks go to the treasurer and benchers for the use of the hall and indeed the bench rooms behind me, uh, where after my address I hope that you will join the brilliant Barbara Mills KC, who I'm delighted to say joins me as vice chair for this year, Amrit Danua, the chair of the Young Bar Committee, Lorinda Long, the Bar Council treasurer, and me for a reception. Uh, my thanks go to them and to Malcolm and all the Bar Council team uh, for the excellent work that they do, their unstinting support, as well as my family, many of whom are here tonight. Before I address you as to my priorities for the year, the 130th in the Bar Council's history, I thought it useful to provide a brief introduction to my background as it informs my perspectives on the issue currently facing the justice system and the Bar specifically. I was brought up in Stamford Hill in Hackney. I was wholly state educated and fortunate to study at Cambridge University, where I was one of the last beneficiaries of a local authority grant. Remember that. My father was an architectural salvage dealer and my mother a stained glass painter. There were no lawyers amongst my family or amongst family friends. A career was, in the law was something I read about and saw fictionalized in John Mortimer's Rumpole, of course, and the rather more racy mid-90s Granada TV drama, legal drama, This Life. Lincoln's Inn helped me with scholarships and a room in a flat in Chancery Lane during bar school, while I worked as an estate agent alongside attending the ICSL, the Inns of Court School of Law. The support the Inn gave me, as all the Inns continue to give, was absolutely critical to me in having the wherewithal to push on to pupillage applications. I succeeded in obtaining a pupillage and then tenancy at Keating Chambers in the construction and engineering field where I've had a very happy 25 years of professional working life. As colleagues in Chambers will testify, however, I've always been restless, dissatisfied with just doing the day job. One consistent interest for me in public policy uh, particularly has been in relation to law and the justice system. I was an early joiner of the Bar Council's Young Bar Committee from 2002, serving along the, alongside the likes of Tom Little, now KC and Senior Treasury Council, and Suella Braverman, you may have heard of her. Later in the noughties, I served on the Executive Committee of the London Common Law and Commercial Bar Association, assisting Margaret Barron KC with the establishment of the Bar's first maternity leave and return mentoring scheme. Like a number of my predecessors, I have a political past and personal political views. As many of you know, I dabbled in party politics, including being an elected councillor from 2006. In 2016, I came back to the Bar Council to serve on the Legal Services Committee, a committee I later chaired and from which position I successfully stood for election to the position of Vice Chair in 2022. So why do I raise the point about my party political experience? In what is most likely to be a general election year, it's important to stress that the Bar Council and my role in it is firmly non-partisan. I'm a lawyer first, and I leave those party political views at the door of this job. The Bar Council represents a group of nearly 18,000 barristers with the widest variety of political views, and we have a role in speaking for them collectively and in the public interest on issues such as access to justice, resources in the efficient working of the justice system, the quality and effectiveness of legislation, adherence to the rule of law, and our international legal obligations. Where I criticise particular government action or proposed legislation, I do so just as my predecessors have done, because relevant issues are engaged. We do comment on matters within the Bar Council's remit that have been politicised. While it is of course the case that there should be no swooning adulation of lawyers, and barristers should be held to account for their conduct and professionalism, that is an entirely different matter to blaming barristers for the sins of their clients and their causes. It is not appropriate to trawl through a barrister's case history to pick out unsympathetic clients or causes that they've acted for and to hold them responsible for the outcome of a given case. 
That is to wholly misunderstand and misrepresent the role of a barrister in our system and is contrary not just to the cab rank rule, of which we've heard much over the last year, but the understanding of the role of a lawyer wherever in the world there is adherence to the rule of law, as encapsulated in the UN basic principles on the role of lawyers. The Lord Chancellor has already done great service on rule of law issues and is deserving of our thanks in, for example, reminding his colleagues and the public of the importance of the independence of the judiciary in his public reaction to the Supreme Court's decision on the Rwanda case, and indeed on other topics such as the reform of indeterminate sentences, although a number of us would like him to go further. Something, though, he has rightly called a stain on our justice system. I've no doubt that he and the Attorney General, who I am pleased is present this evening, remind their colleagues and Conservative Central Headquarters privately about the proper role of lawyers and the inappropriateness of attacks on lawyers, such as Jacqueline McKenzie of Lee Day solicitors, who are simply doing their jobs. And more recently, I have to say, the attacks on the leader of the opposition by reason of the causes of his clients when a practicing barrister some 20 years or so ago. However, in circumstances where the level of public legal education and understanding in this country remains so poor, we would welcome some public words by leading conservative and labor lawyer politicians to deprecate such attacks and to help to explain the role of lawyers. Uh, that would be extremely welcome. The Bar Council will continue to play its part but the misapprehension about the role of lawyers reflected in some parts of the media, if left unchallenged, is corrosive of public perceptions of lawyers, the administration of justice, and ultimately the rule of law. It's appropriate at this point to draw the attention uh, to the work on this topic of my immediate predecessor as chair, Nick Vinyl KC. Nick was indefatigable on rule of law issues, as on everything he tended to as chair and the bar owes him a great debt. <laughs> Further on the topic of the rule of law, we are also grateful for the Lord Chancellor's careful attention to the issues that arise in connection with the truly appalling post office horizon miscarriages of justice. For our part, we think there is a case for Parliament to review wholesale the role of corporates in bringing private prosecutions. So far as the immediate circumstances of the victims are concerned, it's important that any proposals are consistent with due process and the separation of powers, in particular to give them the proper exoneration to which they're surely entitled. Turning to the state of the justice system, where the issue is a lack of government investment, I put it bluntly, the criminal and justice and family justice systems are at the point of structural failure. The need for significant investment is great and it is urgent. From front to end of the criminal justice system, the picture is bleak. Police back office staff who traditionally processed statements and evidence for trial purposes have been decimated. According to the Law Society, in the first six months of 2023, over 50% of magistrates' courts trials conducted on the new common platform involved unrepresented defendants. The CPS itself remains under-resourced following the 30% cuts of a decade ago. The court estate is dilapidated and prisons are full. The bar is particularly concerned with the Crown Court system. Here, the outstanding caseload in the Crown Court is the largest it has ever been at 66,500 outstanding cases at the end of September. Disposals continue to fall behind case receipts, so the caseload continues to get bigger. The time between receipt and disposal has got ever longer. The average outstanding duration of criminal cases has stuck stubbornly above 290 days for the last year the highest ever. Only a minority of cases achieve the government's better case management stipulation of six months from receipt to the start of trial. And indeed, 10% of cases in the Crown Court are now outstanding for two years or more. Even if the first day of trial is reached, more than one in six trials 
are ineffective. One of the major reasons for this is the unavailability of any barrister to act as prosecution or defence counsel. If it were not for the excellence and commitment of the judges, staff, solicitors and barristers who work in the system, it would already be wholly discredited in the eyes of the public. So why has this happened? As set out in the detailed and careful Bellamy Review of November 2021, there are several factors. Increased complexity, increased demands with the introduction of ever more offences, coupled with longer sentences, declining rates of what HMCTS calls productivity, underpinned by a lack of resourcing of the entire system for a decade and more. And then the heavy blow of complete closure over many months during the COVID pandemic. Essential work goes on to tackle the myriad operational issues by the Crown Court Improvement Group. The Criminal Legal Aid Review Board, under the leadership of the retired uh, circuit judge, Her Honour Judge Deborah Taylor, is doing useful work in seeking to align remuneration with the principles of better case management. The Bar Council engages fully and positively with both these important bodies. However, this work, important though it is, is not succeeding in preventing the increase in the backlog or in improving overall timeliness. Despite substantial, though so far as legal aid solicitors are concerned, incomplete, implementation of Lord Bellamy's minimum financial recommendations, the financial settlement is utterly inadequate to meet the present needs. The backlogs are now 10% higher than when Lord Bellamy produced his review, and timeliness is 25% worse. On recent figures, the legal aid, legal aid spend on the criminal bar in real terms remains a touch below 40% of what it was 10 years ago, and spending on the judges and courts is down by 13.5% compared to 2010-11, and set to fall another 2% in real terms over the coming two years. The present financial settlement for the criminal justice system is like being asked to make two loaves of bread but having the ingredients for less than one. And publicly funded lawyers are good but they're not miracle workers. More, much more, is required for the court system, the CPS and in criminal legal aid to halt the worsening position and to seek to return at least to the position pre-COVID. This need is now urgent. I say this because we're now seeing two types of serious and systemic behavioural change which threaten to accelerate the failure. The first lies in the number and pattern of guilty pleas. Government data shows a marked decline in overall guilty pleas now ticking below 60%. More disturbing still is that this is combined with what can only be characterised as a collapse in the percentage of guilty pleas being entered at first hearing. At the first opportunity for a defendant to plead guilty in the Crown Court, we've seen a drop in guilty pleas from 84% in 2014 to 36% in the first half of last year. If these trends continue, what we are witnessing is a breakdown in the compact essential to any effective criminal justice system governed by the rule of law that perpetrators plead guilty early for a discounted sentence and to start the process of rehabilitation. This saves the state the cost of trial and most importantly saves victims and witnesses from the harrowing experience of reliving the crime when having to give evidence at trial. If the compact is broken, it will put the criminal court system already running at close to boiling point under unbearable pressure accelerating the rate of increase in the backlog and pushing out further the time within which cases are dealt with. This is what the Institute for Government has called a performance doom loop, as it becomes more and more apparent that the system cannot cope, and as young criminal men who should be pleading guilty at an early stage become more aware, as they're bound to do, that their day of reckoning is getting pushed back further and further, and perhaps may never come at all. This is not tough on crime, but the very opposite. Conversely, for the innocent who have been wrongly accused, they are left, apparently indefinitely, languishing with the pending prosecution hanging over them. 
So my concern then is of a complete collapse in public confidence in the system, one where victims and witnesses become ever more disillusioned or simply give up, justice neither done nor seen to be done. A second behavioural change is also taking place. This is more parochial but is fundamental to the proper and efficient administration of justice. This is that there are no signs, unfortunately, of improvement in the numbers of junior barristers staying to work in crime. Despite the welcome injection of funding in September 2022, barristers are continuing to leave criminal practice and not returning to criminal practice after periods of leave, and insufficient numbers are willing to train and take up prosecution tickets, in particular for rape and serious sexual offences, which are both inadequately paid and have shamefully historically been given lower status. As the late great former Lord Chief Justice, Lord Judge, whose life we commemorate later this month at Temple Church, put so presciently in response to the legal aid consultation back in 2013, many lawyers have already ceased to act in legal aid cases. Many of those entering either branch of the legal profession seek to avoid publicly funded areas if their ability and promise permit them the choice. Some of the proposed changes are likely to transfer rather than save costs. It cannot be emphasized too strongly that good advocacy reduces cost. Poor advocacy is wasteful of resources. Cases are less well prepared and they occupy more time and take longer to come to a conclusion while simultaneously increasing the risk of mistakes and miscarriages of justice. Unfortunately, the proverbial chickens have come home to roost. The reasons are not, of course, just remuneration, but working conditions, the decline in support available from legal aid solicitors and the CPS, and the unremitting emotional challenge these cases present. It is unfortunate, then, that in the recent mini-budget, this most fundamental of public services was given no protection, and real terms cuts are therefore certain across the piece. And while we have very good personal and working relationships with the justice teams on the front benches of both main political parties, I have to say it is utterly disappointing that neither has yet committed itself to applying, committing the resources needed, and yet each keeps identifying more new offences and proposing greater demands on the criminal justice system. I have to say, frankly, if you wish the ends, you have to provide the means. What is needed? So far as the bar is concerned, I urge both parties to take the approach Margaret Thatcher took prior to the 1979 election in relation to police remuneration. Mrs. Thatcher recognized when she increased police officer salaries by around 45% on coming in that an effective justice system relies on appropriately remunerating those responsible for its operation. The Bar Council endorses the policy exchange think tank's recent recommendation to the effect that in addition to the 15% increase in publicly funded fees already secured for advocates working in the Crown Courts, the government should immediately apply a further 10% and that further increases in line with inflation should be made each year for the next five years as an overall cost that we calculate at about 46 million per annum, that is in, to take the words of the last Lord Chief Justice, Lord Burnett of Malden, little more than a rounding error in many departments. While that will still leave overall criminal barristers' earnings around 15 to 20% short in real terms than 10 years ago, I'm hopeful that this, with other resource improvements, would improve professional life at the criminal bar, sufficient to both attract new and retain existing experienced counsel, reduce significantly the number of ineffective trials that are so detrimental to the system and undermining of public confidence, bear down on the backlog and bring the criminal court system back from the brink. That's not to mention the savings in other departments such as health and social services. In the meantime, the bar can and should do what it can to alleviate the position at no or modest cost to government. Uh, at the point of entry, I would like to see an expansion of the programme of match funding of additional pupillages in publicly funded work. The profession presently, through generous support of the Inns of Court, supports 33 match funded additional pupillages. The government could help with this. May I take the opportunity to suggest a manifesto commitment to match funding 100 additional 
criminal pupillages. Perhaps, if it suits badges up to 500 new prosecutors in five years, that would come at a cost of no more than about £1.5 million per year. We as a profession also must do whatever is necessary to match demand with supply and fill all pupillage vacancies that are made available. And I welcome the initiatives of the circuit leaders to encourage access to the profession outside of London. I will continue to work with them over the coming year to ensure that where we have the capacity to do so, they will receive the full support of the Bar Council in relation to their respective endeavours. On the issue of retention, Middle Temple runs a superb returner scheme targeted at barristers who have taken long periods away from practice to engage and encourage with them and, and to encourage them back to work at the bar. It starts with coffee mornings and drinks and moves on to guidance for individuals and chambers, individual coaching and advocacy refresher courses. I will work to see that such a scheme is available for all barristers. As a profession, we should also be open to greater transference between the employed and self-employed sectors. Historically, when a member of the bar has started their career in employment or has departed from self-employed practice into the CPS, the Serious Fraud Office, or the Government Legal Service, they have found it challenging to join or return to a chambers. Employed practice, however, involves the development and application of some quite different skills to those of self-employed practice. In, in particular, the management of large teams and, of course, has the benefits that come with employment and can be equally professionally fulfilling. I turn then to the family court system. Unfortunately, it is not faring much better than crime, with private law cases, including child custody cases, taking an average 47 weeks to re reach a final order, continuing an upward trend since the middle of 2016. Legally aided access to advice and representation in most cases is now non-existent, often leaving the party who has the power and the money at a significant advantage over the other party in relation to the litigation. Public family law matters, care cases, too, are suffering from significant delays. Here, case progression suffers from poorly resourced state authorities, including CAFCAS, the Children and Family Court Advisory and Support Service, and the mismatch in public funding of representation, with families often not catered for. The problem in family cases is a structural one. They are taking longer to dispose of and require more hearings. More expert reports are commissioned than used to be required. There has been very significant work by the judges and professions, including a 25% increase in sitting days, but still the backlogs grow. Demand is down by 10% compared to the period before COVID, but productivity, the throughput of cases, is down by 20%. It is hard to resist the conclusion that what we are witnessing is a chronic decline in the effectiveness of the family justice system following the implementation of the Legal Aid, Sentencing and Punishment of Offenders Act 2012, which extinguished the availability of legal aid for most family law litigants who previously qualified. We at the Bar Council consider that government has a primary duty to ensure that children already suffering from family breakdown are not further punished by overly extended divorce or care proceedings that are so corrosive to their life chances. Unfortunately, it is difficult to discern any political will at present to provide the resources to make sure that happens. One current step is movement towards compulsory mediation in private law in private family law cases. While I have doubts myself about the effectiveness of mediation that is compulsory, regarding it as something of an oxymoron, mediation can be appropriate where parties are properly informed and the mediator is relevantly trained. The offer to litigants, however, needs to go beyond the £500 voucher to pay a mediator that's currently provided. Parties need legal advice. They need to understand the nature of the differences between them, the merits of their legal position, and how to make the most of the mediation. So my further retail political offer, suggestion, is that at a minimum, government matches the value of the mediation voucher with funding for legal advice for each party in advance of mediation. 
That should go somewhere to redress the imbalance that power and money gives one party over the other, improve the success rates of the mediations, and start to bear down on the backlogs. I turn now to civil justice, where the position is more positive, albeit mixed. On the one hand, the digitalization at the front end of the justice system in relation to civil disputes, led by the master of the roles, is bearing fruit with those with technical ability enabled to commence and then conclude formal disputes online easily and quickly. And the Lord Chancellor is to be congratulated for listening to the profession as to the level of the advocate's fixed fee in fast track and the new intermediate track cases. In relation to fast track cases, by April 2024, there will have been an increase of around 23% in the fees that may be recovered for the work at trial of counsel compared to the position prior to October 2023. This is the first increase in a decade. This will be a real fillip to the junior bar, rendering a career sustainable that was becoming untenable. I hope that a similarly positive approach will be taken to our proposals for part recovery of brief fee, where the case is vacated shortly before trial by reason of settlement or court unavailability. The principle must be that reasonable payment should be made for work done. On the more negative side, the country suffers from serious and wide-ranging legal advice deserts. Another tragic consequence of the 2012 LASPO Act was the evisceration of the most, mostly unregulated and charitable legal advice sectors, with the law centres movement being dealt a near-fatal blow. Reliable, trusted online advice can play a role here, but many who need such advice will never be able to make use of such a facility. And the mixed results in the government's early legal advice pilot shows how difficult it will be to recreate what we previously had. In the public interest, some recreation of green form advice or an equivalent would pay enormous dividends in relation to access to justice, to combating social exclusion and despair, and would be at a modest cost compared to the savings made across other departments as citizens are able to identify the nature of their problems and the way in which to resolve them. I turn then to the profession itself, and there are areas where the bar must get its own house in order. Work continues in relation to the recommendations of the Race at the Bar Report 2021. I have enjoyed being involved with and am proud of the bar's internship scheme in conjunction with the 10,000 Black Interns Programme. Some progress is being made, especially on access to the profession, but issues of retention, progression, income inequality and allocation of work are neglected by many chambers. We expect to report further on progress later this year. The Bar Council's November 2023 earnings report laid bare the continuing substantial earnings discrepancy between men and women barristers. This year we will focus on the cohort where the problem should be the easiest to address, the call band of, eight, of zero to three years call which has a 17% disparity in earnings between men and women. While part-time working and time out of the profession may go some way to explaining differences in earnings between the genders in the middle stages of a career and onwards, it is difficult to believe that these reasons can be a substantial cause of difference in earnings at the beginning of a career. On conduct and professional behavior, Last month, we published data from the Barristers Working Lives survey, which showed a dismal picture of 1,344 of the 3,000 or so barristers who responded on the topic, saying that they had experienced or observed bullying, harassment, or discrimination in the last two years, marking an increasing trend from previous surveys. While it may well be that greater awareness and coverage of these issues across a number of sectors has resulted in barristers being more willing to identify and report experiences of bullying, harassment and discrimination, it may well also be that prevalence is increasing. Either way, the number of reports identifies an unacceptable and systemic problem that requires a significant response. The Bar Council therefore is commissioning a review to consider and identify solutions. And we want to give everyone an opportunity to shape the terms of reference. So please submit your thoughts to us 
and also help us identify good examples of existing initiatives. Stresses of modern professional life at the bar and in court are as significant of their, as, they, as it has ever been, and everyone can have a bad day at the office. However, repeat offenders committing acts of harassment and discrimination, those who repeatedly target women or people of colour, need to be formally disciplined. Other unprofessional and bullying behaviour, not reaching the threshold of actionable misconduct, for reference to the Bar Standards Board, needs different treatment. Today I make a simple initial point, pending the investigation by the review, that those who observe such behaviours being experienced by others should not think it enough to leave it to the victim to deal with. All of us opponents or bystanders need to take advantage of the informal means of addressing this behaviour that are available. That is, whether through simply recognising the behaviour for what it is and acknowledging it to the person who has suffered it, or through raising matters informally through heads of chambers, circuit leaders, resident judges, the inns and the bar's own anonymous reporting tool, Talk to Spot. This would all contribute, I believe, to the change in culture that is needed. Our wide range of work to support the bar is only possible thanks to the funding we receive, including through members subscribing to the bar representation fee. So this is my pitch. You will have the opportunity to pay this voluntary contribution during the authorization to practice process next month. I hope that you will make a contribution. I now turn to regulation. It is important to remember that the regulatory framework contained in the Legal Services Act 2007 amounted to a compromise between self-regulation of the legal professions, which had been the position over centuries, and wholly independent regulation, the Clementi Compromise. This is reflected in the structures in the Act. The Bar Council is the approved regulator under the Act, but is required to delegate the regulatory functions, which we choose to delegate to the Bar Standards Board. The key stipulation is that decisions relating to the exercise of regulatory functions are, so far as may be practicable, taken independently from the decisions of the Bar Council in its representative capacity. The BSB therefore independently sets and polices minimum standards in professional conduct, training and authorisation. The Act also made provision for a regulatory performance oversight regulator, the Legal Services Board. The LSB's functions are stipulated by the Act. Consistent with the compromise embedded into the Act, the LSB is not a sector regulator nor a market regulator. Indeed, it carries out no direct regulation of the legal professions at all. However, it does set the rules relating to the relationship between the approved regulator and those to whom the regulatory functions are delegated, called the internal governance rules. And these rules are under review this year. Taking the Bar Standards Board first, I would like to welcome the improvement in the performance of the BSB under the effective stewardship of its chair, Catherine Stone OBE, over the past year or so, particularly in relation to the timeliness of the processing of conduct complaints. There remains further to go, but the trends are in the right direction, and the staff of the BSB are to be congratulated for their efforts. There are, however, two areas of a more critical nature that I would like to comment on. First, value for money. The BSB's spend has increased by 64% over the last six years, at a rate more than double that of inflation, in what for parts of the bar have been very difficult times indeed. Now more than 70% of the practicing certificate that you pay goes to the regulators. And it is disappointing that it was only last year, some years into the recovery strategy, that the BSB commissioned an end-to-end -end process and productivity review. Nevertheless, we look forward to reviewing draft proposals for change before final decisions are made. Now that the BSB appears to have turned the corner on performance, it must also look to bear down on the costs to the profession, ultimately, of course, passed on to clients. The BSB is now an outlier in terms of regulatory cost, charging per barrister, on average, £684, compared to the per solicitor equivalent cost of £436. 
While I accept that there are economies of scale that solicitors benefit from compared to the bar, this is at least significantly mitigated by the bar being a significantly lower regulatory risk. As performance continues to improve, coupled with increased productivity that should arise from the current review, I hope we can look to reductions in the regulatory cost to the bar similar in pace to the rate at which it went up. Secondly, I refer to the BSB's current consultation on the regulation of barristers in chambers. We welcome the proposal that the BSB should draw together on its website in one place all the minimum practice management requirements and standards imposed on self-employed barristers that for most barristers are fulfilled through chambers. We at the Bar Council are carrying out a parallel exercise, drawing together all the best practice guidance and toolkits for chambers management into a single place. This is an example of helpful and mutually supportive working together that the BSB and the Bar Council can do. One aspect of the consultation does, however, cause me some concern. That is when the consultation starts to promote the voluntary merger of chambers simply for the purposes of making regulatory compliance more comprehensive and easier. This is respectfully putting the cart before the horse. There remain many barrister sole practitioners and 140 or so chambers are of fewer than 25 members. And while the paper rightly identifies that it would not be appropriate to graduate regulatory obligations on chambers according to size, the very suggestion of mergers on chambers for regulatory compliance reasons indicates that the BSB's expectations as to the necessary level of regulatory compliance activity is pitched too high. It must not be forgotten that under the 07 Act, individual barristers are the regulated person, not sets of chambers. So I would urge the BSB not to pile on more or yet more before the event compliance obligations upon all, but please to concentrate on minimum standard setting and the policing of actual misconduct. I turn then to the Legal Services Board. The Bar Council has open, cordial relations with the LSB, in particular with its new chair, Alan Kershaw, even where there are sometimes differences of view, in particular as to the LSB's role and remit. My focus this year will be on the review of the internal governance rules that's being undertaken by the LSB. The current 2019 version of the rules does not properly reflect the compromise of semi-independent regulation of the legal professions that is found in the 07 Act, but imposes complete independence, not only of regulatory decision-making, but in practice on a host of operational matters, including complete autonomy on budget setting, denuding the approved regulators, the Bar Council, of any effective role. This is inconsistent, I believe, with the scheme of the 07 Act, where responsibility for regulatory performance including all statutory sanctions, lies with the approved regulators. The current rules render the semi-independent settlement built into the statutory scheme unworkable. The Bar Council would, therefore, like to see the rules restored to the more balanced and practicable position contained in earlier iterations. I turn to the timing of call. This is the point in a person's education and training at which they're entitled to be called to the bar and to be called a barrister thereafter. As matters stand, unlike other professions, in particular solicitors, a person may call themselves a barrister after having completed only the academic and vocational training, not the on-the-job traineeship or pupillage necessary to be able to practice as a barrister. This has been the subject of much detailed argument last year and, in fact, for the past several decades and it is currently under consideration by benches of the inns. The Bar Council is clear that change is needed. I will not rehearse in detail arguments already fully articulated, but in summary, first there is consumer detriment associated with clear confusion as to who is entitled to call themselves barrister and who is not. It is difficult enough to explain to the public what a barrister is and does without having to explain that there are two categories of barrister. Secondly, the unfair cost burden 
of regulation of all 70,000, and that's how many there are, uh, or so barristers, is placed on just 18,000 practicing barristers. The BSB has to date failed to identify what the cost associated with this is, but it is clear that it is significant. Thirdly, the availability of call to the bar gives false encouragement to those who have little prospect of obtaining a pupillage and therefore of practicing at the bar. Conversely, the thousands being called each year are likely to discourage those of merit without the benefit of a bank of mum and dad who might otherwise take the risk of incurring the costs of training and seek pupillage. And finally, there's the argument of principle. There should be a connection between the title and what you do. I've not heard serious challenge to these positive arguments for change. Three points against have been made, and I will briefly address those. The first is that a change to link call to the bar to the successful of completion of pupillage hands the keys to the profession to chambers and employers who, the argument must be, cannot be trusted to consider the sustainability of the profession as they will be focused on their own narrow business needs. This argument might have had traction in the time where the inns held the responsibility for who might be called to the bar, but since the 07 Act, the keys are in fact held by the 20 or so educational institutions who provide the bar vocational course and whose sole business interest is to maximize the number who take the course. Thus, we end up with the thousands being called each year. Secondly, the argument is that a wide call enhances the soft power of the bar internationally, particularly amongst Commonwealth countries from where large numbers of students come. This encourages links between the jurisdictions, even encourages adherence to the rule of law in those countries, and is good for legal exports. I cannot argue that this point is without merit in relation to some jurisdictions. However, I have to say on my recent trip to India, seeking liberalization of that legal market, I saw no signs of such sentimental effects. A far greater significance in the soft power of the English and Welsh justice system is the excellence of our judiciary, many more of whom now take up posts following retirement in international, commercial, and other courts and arbitration. The jurisprudence and procedures of the commercial, TCC, Chancery and other specialist courts. The internationally recognized and easily marketed kite mark of silk. And the international work of the inns, specialist bar associations and others in promoting the English common law and our system of justice. In any event, if there is a soft power benefit of call, there is nothing preventing the inns from introducing an alternative form of membership for those who have no intention of practice at the Bar of England and Wales, and one that's not freighted with the regulatory requirements and cost to the rest of us. Finally, some of those who argue against change contend that limiting call will harm diversity. I simply disagree. The starting point now is that entry to the Bar, both at pupillage and tenancy, there is diversity in that the bar is representative of that cohort of the general population, both in terms of gender and race. In terms of social mobility, there is more, this is more difficult to track, but clearly there is more work to be done. About 35% of the current intake to the practicing bar is privately educated, as against 18% of the A-level cohort. Changing of the timing of call will, I think, improve diversity as it will allow the inns and others to concentrate their educational, scholarship and other resources on those who have both real intentions and real prospects of succeeding at the bar. Focused and sustained support to those of merit, but perhaps not means, instead of spreading those resources far more thinly. It will also remove the current apparently poor point of comparison to the public and those thinking of a career at the bar between those who successfully complete the vocational course and are called to the bar and those who obtain pupillage. As those without intentions or real prospects are put off taking the bar vocational course. That may encourage those from less privileged backgrounds of real merit to take the risk and cost of the vocational course, improving diversity further. 
Much heat, as I've said, has been caused on this debate over decades. However, stepping back, I think it's plain, isn't it, that you would not start here. In my view, and I believe it reflects the mainstream view of the practicing bar, in this respect, the bar should be like, in line and like other professions. I have, for example, yet to meet a junior barrister who considers the present arrangements sensible. I hope that we can finally make progress on this long-standing question this year. Now, there's much else on the agenda of the Bar Council that I could address, but I'm conscious of the lure of drinks, and I will limit them to just a few further short points. First, if the bar is to survive, it needs to diversify and needs to look beyond just the English and Welsh courtrooms. This may be a non-court-based non dispute resolution in the domestic market, including with the expansion of mediation, offering a variety of opportunities for barristers as mediators and mediation advocates, or in family law arbitration. It may also be internationally. Last year, some 2,400 or so barristers exported their services, bringing in £420 million in revenue. I will continue to work on expanding the range and depth of international markets for our specialist services. Linked with this is that practitioners are rightly concerned about the climate impact of their work. And I'm pleased that as part of the host of work being carried out by the Bar Council's Climate Crisis Working Group, we will this year be able to offer an offsetting scheme for any barrister to take up that is in line with the Oxford principles for net zero aligned carbon offsetting and that is transparent, verified and contributes to sustainable development. I also want to take this opportunity to celebrate the pro bono work of the bar, in particular by and through the bar's two legal charities, Advocate and the Free Representation Unit. This year is the 20th year of the London Legal Walk. The former Lord Chief Justice, Lord Phillips of Worth Matravers, in his, in his 19th year of walking last year, joined 16,000 participants, the largest field in history, who collectively raised a record £950,000 in aid of the London Legal Support Trust. This is a good sum, but I can't help but notice that it amounts to less than £60 per participant. Nick Emerson, the president of the Law Society, and I agree that the professions, particularly large commercial law firms and chambers, must in general do better as we push to get the sum raised above £1 million for the first time in this anniversary year. Finally, as a tonic to the rather bleak picture I presented in relation to the current state of the justice system, I wanted to say a few words in recognition of what a wonderful profession we're fortunate enough to be a part of. Work as a barrister, even in a specialist area such as construction, is marvellous in its range. The intellectual challenges presented, the reliance placed upon wits, and the adrenaline charges associated with advocacy in the courts. Tom Grant Casey, in his book, The Mandela Brief, on the apartheid South Africa cases of Sir Sidney Kentridge Casey, who has just celebrated his 102nd birthday and has fair cause to be called our greatest living advocate. For, forgive me describes how Sir Sidney managed to persuade courts operate, operating under that twisted version of the rule of law, of the merits of his clients' cases, by an absolute mastery of the factual case, understanding of the law as it applied to the facts, and an ability to distill the complexities to their simplest form, underpinned by what he calls a moral authority. This concept describes the apotheosis of the barrister and is a real contrast to the false characterizations of our role, which infest parts of public discourse and media. Moral authority, not because the advocate is articulating his or her personal views, though they may be, but the very opposite, because of the cold professional distance maintained between the advocate and the cause of the client, whatever their private thoughts may be. I hope you'll join me for a drink.